guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Becca, and today's video is sad and depressing and scary, and I hate it. I have wanted to cover this story for a while. However, it deals heavily with the military and not in a favorable light, so I wasn't actually able to do the video until now. I want to preface this all by saying that the military today is not the same as the military back in 2005. Back in 2005, during Operation Iraqi Freedom or Operation Enduring Freedom, it was a completely different beast. The rules of engagement were different, the way that soldiers interacted with each other on post were different, it was just, it's just different. The military is different now. There are programs like Sharp Set in Place, which is like a sexual harassment reporting system, which allows people to report anonymously rape and sexual assault. And it also takes it very, very seriously. Back in 2005, it was uncommon for rape to just be brushed under the carpet and ignored, or the person who got raped or sexually assaulted to be removed from the military. That's not the case anymore. The military takes it very, very seriously. Unfortunately, back in 2005, that wasn't the case, and we are talking about one of those cases today. So, if you like renegade military forces, military cover-ups, and high-ranking people getting away with things that should have put them in prison, then keep watching because you are going to love this video. July 18, 2005, a female soldier calls home to let her parents know that she is going to be coming home from Iraq a little bit sooner. Back in 2005, deployments could last up to 15 months, and she was going to be coming home in maybe eight months. Everyone was very excited because she might even be home by Christmas, and that was her favorite holiday. She made her parents promise not to decorate the tree until she got home because she wanted to be a part of it, and they hung up. Everyone was very excited, everyone was in great spirits, and they couldn't wait for the soldier to get home. Unfortunately, this particular soldier wouldn't make it home in time for Christmas. In fact, she wouldn't even make it home alive. It wasn't until her parents picked her body up from the airport, her coffin draped in an American flag, and her father saw her body for the first time that he realized that something wasn't right. This is the story of Lavina Johnson. Lavina Johnson was the daughter of Dr. John Johnson, a vet himself, and Linda Johnson. And she was born and raised in Missouri. The 5-1 honor roll student was very excited to attend college after high school. And although her parents had financially planned for all of her siblings to go to school, she wanted to do it on her own. She also wanted to go to school out of state. She wanted to go to school in California, and she wanted to do it all on her own. She was a headstrong, determined woman, and nothing could sway her once she'd made up her mind. So although her parents were adamantly against her joining the military, she did it anyway. She was ready to be her own woman and pave her own way. Fresh out of high school, Levena joins the military, the army actually. I wasn't able to find what her MOS was, but I believe it was something in communications. Fresh out of AIT, Levena is deployed and is stationed in Ballad, Iraq. Even while deployed, she called and wrote home a lot telling her family about scorpions that she saw, that some people had forgotten to pack a cot and they had to sleep on the floor, but not her. She remembered her cot and she slept comfortably in her tent as much as you could. She talked about how hot and how heavy all of the gear was. She also talked about how unbelievably beautiful the night was. July 18th, 2005, just eight weeks into her deployment and eight days shy of her 20th birthday, she calls home to tell her parents that she might be coming home early. In fact, she might even be home for Christmas. She was so excited about it, everybody was. They weren't expecting her home for several more months. Back in 2005, it wasn't unheard of for a deployment to go 15 months. And for her to be coming home in eight months instead of 15 was something to be happy about. She hung up the phone, Everyone was excited and they all went on about their evenings. Unfortunately, Lavina wouldn't make it home alive. A few days later, soldiers come knocking on the Johnson family front door. Right away, being a vet himself, Dr. Johnson knew that something was very, very wrong with their daughter. They let the soldiers into the home and immediately they said, I regret to inform you, but your daughter, PFC Lavina Johnson, is dead. At first they said it was in the line of duty. She went down valiantly fighting for her country. 
Now, Levena worked in the communications building. She wasn't a combat MOS. She worked inside basically an office job. So her father said, how, how did she die in the line of duty? She, she works in the communications building. And the soldier let it slip that her wound was actually self-inflicted. Dr. Johnson caught this and said, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that my daughter killed herself? Immediately, the soldier starts backpedaling. I didn't say that. I didn't say she killed herself. It's being investigated. Almost right away, Dr. Johnson knew something was wrong. The following day, a casualty liaison comes to their home. A casualty liaison basically helps you arrange the funeral, arrange for a headstone, um, arranges the uh, casualty benefits. It helps the family navigate what happens when a soldier dies. Now the casualty liaison stressed to the family that Lavina had shot herself by sticking her M16 in her mouth and pulling the trigger. So there was a lot of facial damage and damage to her head in general and he stressed how important it was for them to have a closed casket. You don't want to see your daughter like this. That's not how you want to remember her. Dr. Johnson already knew he wanted to see the body. It wasn't going to be a closed casket. According to the military, July 19th, the day after their very happy phone call, Lavena put her military issued M16 in her mouth and pulled the trigger. The 5-1 Camo soldier put her 40 inch lightweight 5.56 air cooled gas operated magazine fed M16 in her mouth and pulled the trigger. They said that she was depressed. Her family didn't see that. Her family talked to her often and said she was jubilant and happy and in great spirits. How could she be depressed? They said, well, her eating habits changed. Her eating habits changed? How? And this is not a joke. They said that she started eating ice cream three or four times a day eating ice cream. It's 120 degrees in Iraq. I'm surprised she didn't crawl inside of an ice cream tub to live there. Her eating ice cream four or five times a day wasn't depressed. She was trying to cool down. But that was their excuse for why she was depressed. Mm -hmm. The Johnsons were told that Lavena's boyfriend of two months broke up with her over email. She got very upset about this and she went with a friend to the PX, which is like a grocery store, bought M&Ms and some soda. They went back to the barracks. She drank some of her soda, ate some of her M&Ms, and then left again by herself. She took her emails that she had printed out, stuck them in her pocket, and went to a dirty, dilapidated, gross contractor's tent, found an aerosol can, tried to light her emails on fire, and then shot herself in the mouth. Initially, she said that she pulled the trigger of her weapon with her big toe, but the medical examiner's report said that she pulled the trigger with her right thumb. Her dad wasn't really buying this. It just didn't sound like his daughter to do something like this. And on July 20th, day that his daughter should have been turning 20, her father was identifying the body. Right away, he knew that everything that he had been told was a lie. Just looking at her, he could see that her face was broken up, her teeth were broken, that the gunshot wound wasn't where you would expect to be, and it wasn't the size you would expect it to be. If someone shot themselves in the mouth, the gun would be in an upward motion and the bullet wound would be somewhere towards the top of the skull, maybe the bottom of the skull, but it definitely wouldn't be on her left temple. That's just not where it would be, right? Right in this area, it just wouldn't. Now I will admit that the way that the 5.56 round is developed or was developed was not necessarily to kill but to injure. Wait, so once it entered the body, it would tumble around a little bit and kind of force itself into what's known as yaw. Basically, yaw is when a bullet enters the body and it starts tumbling. So is it possible? Yeah, maybe. Especially with all of the bone inside the skull, it's possible for it to tumble and come out the other direction. However, it's not the right size and we're gonna cover that a little bit later. Also, her father noticed that she had a white dress glove glued to her right hand. You don't take your dress uniform with you on deployment because you're not gonna need it and you're not gonna wear it and it wouldn't stay clean. So that immediately was weird for her to have this glove glued to her hand. The autopsy was finished July 22nd. The medical examiner said that he would contact Dr. Johnson immediately upon finishing the autopsy. He didn't actually call Dr. Johnson until August 2nd. And when Dr. Johnson talked to the medical examiner, he found out that not only did they not perform a rape kit, which is kind of standard procedure, there was also no sign of any kind of struggle and that the bullet wound was obviously the exit wound. When her dad said, yeah, but it's in the side of his, her skull, and the medical examiner argued with him saying, no, 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 it's in the back. Dr. Johnson said, I saw it. It's in her left temple. And the medical examiner said, well, it depends on how you look at it. 
Dr. Johnson immediately knew that everything was wrong and he demanded to see the case file for his daughter. It took using the Freedom of Information Act to even get any of that. This is also the first time that Dr. Johnson learns that his daughter had been raped. She was being treated for an STD. To me, that makes the fact that she was coming home early from deployment make a lot of sense. If someone is raped on deployment, they'll send them back. They're not going to force them to stay in that environment. So if she had been raped and was filing charges against her rapist, it's not unusual for them to send her back early. There was also some photos in this as well. They were terrible photos. They were Xerox. They were grainy. They were black and white. They were kind of just poor, poor quality. And I don't feel right about posting those pictures. Uh, in this video, so I'm going to describe what they look like to you. You absolutely can find them online. I am going to link The Silent Truth, which is a documentary talking about this case, below in the description box. But for the sake of this video, I'm just going to describe the photos to you. So the crime scene itself is in a tent. The, the Levena is laying on the ground with her arm over her head like this. There's a cot to her left. There's an aerosol can and a bullet casing to her right. On her left, on the other side of the cot, is her M16. So what that leads you to believe is that she shot herself, managed to put the rifle on the other side of the room, and then go back and lay down. Which doesn't make sense to me. Also, if you've never fired an M16, when you're firing it, the shell casing will exit to your right. So if she were sh pointing her gun forward and shooting, it makes sense for the round to eject and be near her right leg. If she's shooting herself, the rifle is going to be facing, the exit port is going to be facing the other direction. It's going to exit to her left. So why on earth is it under her right leg? Also, who the heck put it on the other side of the room? There was a Xerox copy of a CD. Who Xerox a copy of a CD? To this day, the family thinks that it's someone that feels bad for them and wanted them to know that there was more information available to them. Around the same time, they went to CBS, the news station, and told them all about this. CBS put them into contact with Tina Price's family. Tina Price committed suicide under similar mysterious circumstances after reporting a rape. Her mother told Dr. Johnson to get a second autopsy and do their own ballistics report. So they did. CBS paid for a second autopsy to be done and ballistics tests to be done. This is where everything goes completely crazy. First, the military's own report said there was no gunshot residue on anywhere on Levena, meaning that she didn't even handle the weapon that shot her. According to the ballistics test, the exit wound was more consistent with a smaller caliber handgun, more likely an M9 than an M16. The autopsy was the horrible part. The autopsy showed bruising to her face, bruising to her cuts and bruising to her upper chest. It showed that her teeth were loose and her jaw was broken. It showed evidence of remodeling, surgical remodeling on a broken nose. It also showed that a piece of her tongue was missing as well as pieces of her vagina and her anus. It showed that her neck was broken. It showed that underneath that glove that was glued to her right hand was third degree burns all over her hand. Now, if they were trying to light Levena on fire or they were trying to prevent her from getting any DNA under her fingernails, that would explain why the glove was there. And let's just take a moment here. If you are ever kidnapped or taken for any reason, you leave as much DNA as you can and you take as much. You scratch and you bite and you spit and you pull out your hair at the roots and you bite if you put in the car, you bite the leather of the car seat. You want proof that you were everywhere. He can't clean up all of the evidence, no matter how good he is. So that's just a side note. All I'm saying is leave as much DNA evidence as you can and take as much as you scratch his friggin' eyes out. Anyway, there was also evidence of something corrosive or acidic in her vagina. I think it's more like they probably put quick clot or something like quick clot in her vagina in an attempt to destroy DNA evidence from a very apparent sexual assault. Quick clot, they don't use it anymore for this exact reason. When quick, quick clots of powder and when it comes into contact with anything that's wet, like blood, it 
gets really, really hot and it actually will cauterize the wound. They stopped using it because in the heat of battle, if you're putting quick clot into somebody's wound and that powder gets in your eyes or your mouth, now your eyes and your mouth are cauterized and that's a whole nother problem. Also, none of this was in the military's report. Pieces of her body missing, information on her broken neck were missing. And in these photos, there was a trail of blood leading from the outside of the tent to the inside of the tent which seems more consistent was she had the crap kicked out of her. She was drugged bloody into the tent. She was either shot there or shot somewhere else and drug into the tent. And then they tried to light her on fire. It didn't work. You can see in the photos that there is a bench upside down that is burnt near these emails that were burnt as well. So it looks like they tried to use that to start the fire. They tried to catch her on fire. It was just a mess. The unfortunate thing is CBS never even ran the story. They were too scared. There was also magazines that were told if they ran the story, the military wouldn't pay for ad space anymore in the magazine. So they didn't run the story either. They couldn't get a news channel to run the story, but they knew that they had to keep going and they knew that they wanted that CD-ROM that they had Xerox copies of. And they tried to get it from the military and the military said, go get a lawyer. Instead of getting a lawyer, they went one step higher and they went to Congress. Dr. Johnson went to Congressman Lacey Clay and asked for help to get this information and he got it for him. He got the CD-ROM from the military. And again, there's tons of colored photos of her injuries. There's colored photos of the crime scene of her body. And you can tell that she had, she was beaten badly before she was shot. And the exit wound just doesn't make sense if someone shot herself in the mouth. Let alone a, five, a little 5'1 girl isn't gonna be able to hold that 40, we 40 inch weapon and actually shoot herself in the face. That's just not, that's just not even possible. Originally, the military didn't wanna give Dr. Johnson the CD-ROM because the military said that there was names on the CD-ROM that weren't his daughters and they needed to protect those people. Dr. Johnson was like, I, what? No, you are gonna give me that CD-ROM if it has anything to do with my daughter's rape or my daughter's death. I have a right to that information. And thank God that he went to Lacey Clay because he was able to get that information. I wish that I could say that there was some sort of wonderful resolve and someone awful got exactly what was coming to them, but it was still ruled a suicide. Lavana Johnson was the first woman from Missouri to die in Iraq, and it was because of a suicide. And if they're still fighting it to this day. It is still a closed case. It is still being ruled a suicide. Once the military makes its mind up about something, there's not really any changing it. It's not gonna go back. And sadly, this isn't the only story of sexual trauma and murder. According to retired army Colonel Ann Wright, there are 20 plus female deaths that are suspicious and should be investigated. Nearly all of them occurred on base in Iraq or Afghanistan. 14 of those cases were suicide including Lavena Johnson's. I have included a link to a change.org petition to reopen Lavena's case. I highly encourage you to go sign that. I don't know how much good it will do, but the more voices saying we want justice, maybe we'll get heard. All right, guys, that was the very depressing story of Lavena Johnson. The military is not like that anymore. There are programs put in place, there are things put in place, there are regulations put in place that protect female soldiers now more than ever, and it's only getting better. Is it perfect? No, but it is light years better than it was back in 2005. This story really hit home for me. I, I can only imagine how terrified she was. Being in Iraq at that particular time was scary enough on its own without knowing that the people that are supposed to help and protect you are working against you. There's no one she could go to, there was no one she could turn to for help, she had gone to them for help and they were attacking her now. There's such thing as command rape. Being sexually assaulted or raped by your commanding team, whether that's an NCO or an officer, used to be so prevalent they had a name for it, command rape. Not the case anymore, but who do you go to? Who, who are they gonna believe? The little soldier that's been in for eight months or the staff sergeant who's been in for 12 or eight or nine or whatever, or the officer who's been in forever. There's no one you can turn to, and not only can they get you kicked out of the military, but there's always the fear that they could straight up kill you. It was a really scary time back then. I'm grateful that I wasn't in the military back then. I'm grateful that I didn't have to put up with any of that, but I am very sad that she did and that her family did. Maybe we didn't serve at the same time, but we did serve together. And if I can't 
help her now, what's the point? Just because she's gone, she is absolutely not forgotten. She's not forgotten in my heart, she shouldn't be forgotten in your heart, and she's definitely not forgotten in the hearts of her families. And even though I didn't know her, I still feel some sort of drive to give her a voice, even all these years later. I have linked that change.org petition in the Dropbox below. Let me know that you've gone and signed it. That would make my heart so happy. I don't know how much those change.org petitions actually work. I don't know how much they actually affect, but I, I love the idea that we can give the Johnson family a louder voice. Also in the comments below, let me know what you think of this whole case. What are your theories on this? I think it was someone in her NCO channel did something they weren't supposed to and they got away with it. Let me know what you think. Also let me know if there are any other cases you think that I should address or any other serial killers you'd like to hear about or just let me know that you stopped by. I like reading all your comments and I like kind of knowing that we're all in this together. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I've also linked my merch below so you can still go get yourself a weirdo t-shirt uh, and if you buy one, I wanna see you in it. I wanna have a whole collection of these like weirdo photos. It'll be so great. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys i love you with my entire heart and even though none of us are saints all of us are freaking amazing especially you i see you and i love you bye guys bye.